Hi everyone, welcome to our second Learning at Home webinar. So this is the second webinar in our Learning at Home series. I am Becky Ward, the Education Experience Specialist at Tutor Doctor, and today we're going to talk about finding learning opportunities in your everyday. Uh, so just a little bit of background on me before we get started. I am an Ontario certified teacher. I am certified to teach junior kindergarten to grade 12. Uh, so if you're not familiar with the Ontario system, that is the gambit of our system before students get to the college and university level. Um, I am also uh, certified for special education. I have my special education qualifications um, and I am the mom of two boys. They are six and eight and both of them have special learning needs. So special education um, and special learning needs are definitely something that are near and dear to my heart um, and they're, they're definitely something that I'm passionate about as well as education as a whole. Uh, I've also been a tutor professionally for about 13 years now um, and so this all of this is really my bag education um, learning uh, children's special needs all of it. Uh, so today as I said I'm going to talk to you about finding learning opportunities in your everyday uh, and we have quite a bit to cover. Um, so we're going to talk about teachable moments, so what I mean by that and how you can use them with your children. Uh, learning opportunities, so what that means, as well as some examples of those. Uh, and then I'm going to uh, give some suggestions, advice, and words of reassurance for those of you parents who are really limited on time and are having trouble juggling being a parent and a teacher at the same time. Um, so throughout this webinar, you will find at the bottom of your screen a Q&A section. So if you have any questions that you think of as we're going through this, please drop them into that Q&A section. We'll have some time at the end to, uh, to answer those. And I will also be sending on some additional resources after the webinar, as well as the recording and a special offer for you um, as well. So keep your eye out for that afterwards. All right, so let's get started by talking about teachable moments. So what exactly is a teachable moment? What do I mean by that? You may not have heard that term before. Um, so a teachable moment basically is just an unplanned event that allows for guided learning. So that guided learning could come from you as a parent, it could come from a teacher or tutor, it could also come from an older sibling or more experienced learner. Um, basically what it comes down to is it's an opportunity that's triggered by a child's questions, uh, their curiosity, their exploration, or their experiences, and it allows you to dig deeper into that curiosity to expand upon what they already know, teach them something new, maybe practice some skills. Uh, teachable moments are typically spontaneous. Uh, your child will just come to you with something, or you'll see them trying to work something out, or you'll see that they have tried something and it didn't work. Um, so they're usually very off the cuff and they're fleeting. Um, it's usually the child's very engaged with that in the moment, uh, but they soon move on to something else. So we need to take advantage of it uh, when we can. Um, so with those moments, you can build off of their initial question or experience to introduce those new learnings, build on or deepen their existing knowledge and understanding. Um, and so a great example of this is the current situation has a ton of teachable moments in it. I'm sure we've all had multiple questions from our children about what's going on, why we can't go see our friends, why there's no school, um, and there may be a lot of curiosity surrounding what's going on. So a good example of a teachable moment that came for me yesterday was uh, in the evening after my son had eaten dinner, I sent him to the washroom to wash his hands. He said, go, go wash your hands after you eat. Uh, we're really pushing hand washing here. Uh, and he came back out and he said to me, mom, what's better, washing your washing your hands or using hand sanitizer? And so the initial response to that question would be to answer it directly, which is washing your hands is better. Um, and I know that because uh, the World Health Organization has told me that. And I also uh, have some experience working in a hospital situation where I've had to take hand washing training. Uh, so I do know that. But by just answering the question, basically, I didn't really teach him anything. Um, so I used it as a teachable moment to dig deeper. So we looked at the why. Why is hand washing better 
than uh, using hand sanitizer. So we talked about how it helps to break down the virus and wash it away, whereas hand sanitizer, it stays on your, your skin. Um, and so we built on that and we started to look at what are viruses, what are bacteria. So what are we talking about when we talk about germs? Um, good versus bad bacteria. So how some bacteria is really beneficial for us, other bacteria makes us sick how we rid ourselves of bacteria by hand washing or potentially medication if it's needed, if it's made us ill, that kind of thing. So we dug a lot deeper and I'm not a doctor, so I definitely didn't have all of the answers. So we had the opportunity to then work together to do some research and to look some answers up online and really broaden both of our understandings of this topic. And then we actually had the very beneficial byproduct of being able to talk about what are reliable sources. So uh, the BuzzFeed is not a good source of valuable information, especially right now, that we wanna be looking at the World Health Organization or the CDC or whatever your local uh, health organization might be. That's where we need to be getting our information from. So it, what started off is a very just basic question that you might hear from any eight-year-old turn into the opportunity to really deepen his understanding and learn more about this topic and branch out into even more understanding. Um, and so that's the kind of thing that we're talking about when we're talking about teachable moments. And they are so valuable for our children because they provide context that allows us to introduce and expand this learning. Um, they're able to relate it to things that they already know and are experiencing. Uh, and they're also interested in it in the moment because they've asked you about it. So you're able to build on that curiosity. Had I just walked up to my son while he was playing Minecraft or doing something different, playing with Lego, and said, hey, we're gonna sit down and have a conversation about washing your hands versus using hand sanitizer. I'm sure you can imagine the response I would have gotten. It would have kind of been like, yeah, okay, mom, I, I really don't wanna talk about this. And he wouldn't have taken in any learning. So by using those teachable moments, we can really engage our children, work on their excitement and their curiosity in order to help them learn. And we can help them to become inquiring minds. So people who ask questions and seek out those answers, and we can help them learn how to find those answers for themselves. Um, and it's really helpful because asking questions and getting those answers, that's how we learn. And that's how we grow uh, as people and as a society as well. Uh, it is also really helpful for your relationship with your child because it helps them to see that you are somebody that they can come to with questions and that you're going to answer them, start a conversation with them about it. Um, so that's an awesome byproduct of that as well. So when it comes to actually acting on teachable moments, uh, you may be kind of going, well, I, I don't know how to do that. How am I going to do this? Uh, so the big thing is to just be ready for teachable moments and jump on each opportunity. As I said, they're very fleeting, um, especially depending on the age of your child. They may ask a question and then automatically they've, they've already thought of another one. Um, that reminds me of my six-year-old who's kind of 10 million questions a day. Uh, so we want to jump on every opportunity that we have as it presents itself. Uh, you want to answer the questions openly and honestly and really start that dialogue with them. Help them see that you are somebody that they can come to with these questions. You'll help them find an answer and uh, you can learn together, which is always a lot of fun. Uh, and the big thing is to make sure that you're answering the why. So had I just stuck with washing your hands is better than hand sanitizer, we really wouldn't have had the opportunity to do all the learning that we did. So by answering why hand washing is better, uh, we were able to really dig down and branch off into related topics and ideas uh, that my son really engaged with well. So your child may not have questions about hand washing, but it could be anything. Uh, you might see your child out in the yard trying to build a fort or they're building something with Lego. Um, and you can use those moments to help them and help teach them. So, you know, if they're trying to build a tower from Lego, it keeps falling down. That's a great opportunity to talk about how when we're building something, we need a, a large solid base in order to be able to gain height. Uh, if we don't have a solid base, it's just going to fall over. So that in itself is a teachable moment as well. So the other thing to remember with teachable moments is we don't have all the answers. As I said, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a structural engineer. Um, so if you don't know the answer, just say so. Say, you know what, that's a great question. I'm not sure, let's look it up together and work together to do that research or bring in somebody who is an expert in that. Uh, so for example, my husband is very mechanically and math driven and I am not. So when my children ask me questions about how the car works, 
I can't answer. I can tell you I put gas in it, I press the gas pedal and it goes. Uh, so I defer those questions to my husband and I use those as a moment for my husband to teach both of us uh, because it helps my children to see that I am in engaged in learning just as much as they are, which is always a positive thing to model for them. Um, and then finally, you may not have time to answer these questions or take advantage of these teachable moments right there in the moment. Um, and I get that, I've, I've been in that situation as well. And so the best thing to do for that is to let your child know, hey, I don't have a moment right now to dig into this with you. Let's set some time today after dinner and we're gonna look at this. The great thing about that is that you're letting them know that their questions are valuable and that you wanna take the time with them, but you just don't have it right now. The downside is, is that their curiosity is fleeting. And so the, their interest may have waned by the time that you get the chance to dig into it a little bit deeper. So it might not be as effective, but it's still great to circle back and, uh, and take advantage of that opportunity wherever you can. So let's talk a little bit more about learning opportunities. So teachable moments are a learning opportunity, but what exactly does that mean? Um, and so learning opportunities are just any chance that you have throughout the day to inject even a small piece of learning or skill practice into your child's activity. Um, and so there are lots of different ways that we can do this. We can plan things out in advance and set aside time that this is the activity that we're going to do and this is how it's going to work. Or it can be just be something off the cuff. You know, you see your child working on something and you think, hey, let's jump in and, and let's turn this into a learning opportunity. Um, they can also be self-directed where you just give your child some materials and you let them figure it out on their own. You let them play with it and see what they can discover. So a great example of this is on a nice day, send them outside with some vinegar and baking soda and let them see what happens. And you're probably going to find that that turns into quite the teachable moment because they're going to have lots of questions about why does it fizz and how come after a while it stops fizzing and even though I add more vinegar, it doesn't fizz anymore. And what happens if I put a funnel on top of it? Um, this is why I recommend doing that outside because <laughs> we all know you're going to have a volcano effect and quite the mess. Um, so you can let your children take on those learning opportunities themselves and just figure things out. Or you can have it more structured where you're guiding them you're sitting beside them, you're involved in the activity yourself, um, and you're ensuring that they're taking away some key learnings from it. You can also make your activities, your learning opportunities and activities more action-based, meaning that you have a specific learning goal in mind and they need to take certain steps in order to be successful with that activity. Or you can have it play-based where the idea is just to have a little bit of fun and pick up some learning along the way. The big thing to remember with learning opportunities is that the goal is to just walk away having practiced some skills or learn something new. It doesn't have to be something major. Uh, it doesn't have to be some big key learning that's going to be fundamental for their education. It can just be some practice with multiplication or it can be learning how to make your Lego tower stand up after it reaches a certain height. It doesn't have to be something that is fundamentally core to their education. It can just be something little. Uh, you can also bring in those key fundamentals as well, uh, but don't stress about it. It's, uh, we, the whole goal is just to practice some skills or learn something new. So there are a bunch of different learning opportunities that you come across throughout the day. I'm gonna speak specifically to a few. Uh, the first one is traditional activities. So these are what we typically think about when we think about learning activities for our kids. These are what uh, the school may have sent home to work on right now at home. Uh, these are the kind of things that we think, oh, my child needs a little bit more help. I'm gonna find them this kind of stuff. Um, and so these are typically things like worksheets, um, online games where they're practicing those skills, things like science experiments where they have to follow a specific procedure to get a specific result and reflect on that. They tend to be really structured um, and it, there's a certain way that they need to be completed. Uh, they tend to be planned in that uh, the, the steps are very planned out and it's rather rigid in that. And it tends to be a specific goal that they're working towards. So whether that's skill practice or obtaining a new skill or uh, understanding a new concept, but it tends to have a very specific focus. 
So I did give some suggestions for resources for these kind of activities on the last webinar, and I've got a few more for you. These are resources that I use with my own children as well as in tutoring sessions. I will send them along afterwards, so please don't worry about uh, trying to get these links written down. We'll send them out with the recording. Um, so the first one is K-12 Reader. So this is a really great resource for worksheets. Um, so it focuses on children who are in kindergarten to grade 12, and it's reading, spelling, grammar, vocabulary, composition worksheets, uh, anything basically to do with English and your reading and writing skills. You can find something for it on K-12 Reader. Now it is focused more towards American students, but the thing to remember with these kind of resources is that we can use them no matter where we are. So I'm in Canada, I still use them for, for my own children um, because a reading composition worksheet or um, comprehension, sorry, worksheet, it's pretty standard across wherever you are. The only thing that may be different is spelling. So even if you're not in the US, I recommend checking it out, seeing if there are some things that you can use for your own children. Uh, the next one that I absolutely love is Prodigy. So you may have heard of Prodigy before. It's an online math game and my eight-year-old loves it. Uh, he wakes up at seven o'clock every morning and comes running in going, can I play Prodigy? And I'm going, hey, I haven't had coffee, let me wake up. Holy moly. Um, Prodigy is so much fun for them. And if your child is into those online math games or that style of play, uh, they'll probably find it really engaging. Um, they use it through my son's school, and I think last time I checked on their website, it said something like 50 million students and teachers use the, the platform, um, and it is accessible in multiple countries. Uh, you just have to change your country when you access it, and it's 100% free, which I absolutely love. And I get little emails every once in a while letting me know what my son has been working on and how well he's doing with that. So I highly recommend Prodigy as well. The next one, which I actually stumbled upon recently, but it has made my list of favorites, is TED Ed. And so this is a site where you can build a lesson around any TED Talk or TED Ed resource. Uh, and it's really cool. There's a bunch of existing lessons on there that you can use with your child if you're not comfortable making your own. Um, I spent a lot of time digging into this with my son, probably more than I actually had time for. Uh, and we spent some time learning about ancient Greece and all kinds of different things. Basically, if you can think of it, there's a TED Talk for it, and chances are there's a TED Ed resource as well. And then the last one is Teach It. So this one is geared more towards the UK, but as I said, uh, it can easily be adapted to other countries. Two plus two is four, no matter where you are. Um, so you can definitely use these resources no matter what country you're in. Now, Teach It is really neat because it has a bunch of subsites. So I've given you the link here to Teach It Maths, uh, but I will put in the resource that I email out the links to the other Teach It sites as well. There's one for primary, for English, uh, history, geography, science, languages, uh, and it's a great source for resources and, or sorry, worksheets and those traditional learning activities as well. And they actually have a lot of their content free till the end of April. So I highly recommend checking that out, downloading anything that you think will be useful um, because I have used this quite a bit uh, in tu uh, tutoring sessions and with my own children as well. <clears throat> All right, so those are where the traditional activities, but then there are a bunch of everyday activities that we engage in that provide a really great learning opportunity for our children that we may not even think of as being a learning opportunity. So with these things, you can have them be spontaneous or you can plan out to engage your child in it, whatever works for you. But the big thing with these is that learning is just an excellent byproduct. It's not the end goal of the activity, but you learn something along the way. So a, a good example of this is baking or cooking. So the goal of baking or cooking is to have something to eat. You're hungry, you want to make dinner, or uh, you want to make yourself a baked good because we could all use some extra baked goods right now to help us feel better. And the byproduct of this is that there are actually lessons in things like fractions. So when you're baking, if you're going to double a recipe, you may need a three quarter cup of flour you're going to double it so you actually have to add those fractions you have to add three quarters and three quarters to figure out that you need a cup and a half of flour and so it's a real world application of those fractions that you learned when you were a child and you can share that with your children as well 
It's also a lesson in measurement. So if you're weighing ingredients or you're, um, you're using uh, like milliliters or ounces, it's all measurement. It's all a great way for some hands-on practical experience with that. And then if you're using a recipe, that's following a procedure, which we do in science experiments. We do it all throughout education. We have to follow procedures. So it's practice in that. Uh, and it's a life skill that's helpful to have for the future as well. Uh, so planting a garden is one that came up for me over the weekend. So we have started our vegetable garden that we grow each year. Um, unfortunately, I have to start it inside because here in Canada, we're not ready to plant until probably the end of May. That's when our risk of frost has gone away. But that's a great lesson in life sciences and botany. So learning how seeds germinate, how they grow, what exactly is the fruit or vegetable that we're eating from the plant? Uh, what part of the plant is that? How does it come to be? And you can expand on that to talk about where the food in grocery stores comes from. How did it get there? Um, that you can expand it to talk about the trucking industry and how that's what gets our food to us. And that's how uh, we get the things that we need. And another great example that actually came out of this weekend was also changing a tire. So this was my, all my husband. I am not a tire changer, but uh, if you didn't know, here in Canada, we typically have winter tires and then summer tires, uh, and they're a necessity here. And we've come to the point where winter tires are no longer needed, so we're switching out for our summer tires. And so my husband was working on that, and my six-year-old was in there like a dirty shirt. What you doing, Dad? What's this? What's that? And I realized that changing a tire is actually a great lesson in levers because you're going to jack up the car so that you can remove the tire. It's a lesson in mechanics because my son learned about brakes and how they work to slow down the car, uh, as well as a lesson in engineering. So how does this car go? What makes it work? And how is it created to do the job that we need it to do? So there are all kinds of activities in your everyday. These are just some examples from my everyday uh, that uh, I've been able to pull my children into. But there are all kinds of things. So keep your eye out as you're going about your daily life and you're doing those things and think to yourself, does this incorporate any learning that my children are doing or should be doing? Uh, how can I engage them in this to use these as practical examples of using that learning and to help them practice those skills? So another type of learning opportunity is to take on playful activities. So this is just learning through play. The goal with this is to have fun and to learn something on the, along the way. Um, it works really well for younger children, but it can be adapted for older kids too, depending on what they're interested in um, and their, their level of uh, ability, all of that. Uh, the big thing with learning through play is to work from your child's interests. So it's really hard to engage a child in playing something that they're not interested in. So make sure that you work through their interests in order to engage them. And so some of the ways that you can do this is to just put a learning twist on a regular activity that you already do. So one of my favorites is board games. I use these all the time. Uh, so a lot of games are already set up for learning and they just inherently teach you something. So those ones are great because you don't have to do anything. You just have to play with your kids. And so some good examples of this are things like Monopoly. So Monopoly, I, you're, you're, spending money, you're receiving money, you're making change, so it's good with those basic math skills. It also helps you understand the basics of trading and commerce, um, and it, it gives you life lessons like things like having to pay tax. Uh, so explaining to your child that yes, we pay tax. We pay tax on our income, we pay taxes on our property, we pay taxes on the things that we buy. So all of these are life skills as well as uh, those educational foundation skills that you can practice through the game Monopoly. Uh, another great example is things like Scrabble or Bananagrams. Bananagrams is basically just Scrabble without a board, um, but they're great for word practice. So you can practice building words, reading words, understanding what letter sounds uh, are going to be made based on the letters around it or how that letter is used. Uh, a really just side note to this is that, <clears throat> sorry, my grandmother was actually a teacher as well, and my grandfather had to quit education at the grade three level. And when they got married, he couldn't read. And so my grandma taught him to read by playing Scrabble every day. Um, and that was just something that they did. They always played Scrabble. And it wasn't until I was an adult that my grandmother told me that the reason why was because she was teaching my grandfather how to read. And uh, all the grandchildren, we all learned to read by playing Scrabble too. 
any, so it's a lot of fun. Some families get rather competitive, mine does. Um, my cousin and I can get quite cutthroat about our Scrabble, but it's a great way to practice. Um, and then, so the other suggestion I have for those resources or for those games that allow you to, uh, that allow you to uh, practice some of those basic skills just from the game itself is the game Payday. So this was one I used to play as a kid. And then as I got older, I realized, hey, I'm actually learning something from this. Uh, so like Monopoly, Payday helps you with your ba basic math skills, uh, but it also works on life skill practice, like paying bills, understanding what debt is, uh, budgeting and saving. So those are, it's a great way to engage your children in conversations about that and have them practice those skills while they're having fun at the same time. So then the other way to use board games is to add learning opportunities to the game and to create something slightly different. So when you do this, you want to keep the basic premise of the game the same. So the goal is the same. Uh, you're just adding something to it. So a great example of this is Battleship. So I use this with my kids frequently for uh, math fact practice. So my oldest son's working on his multiplication tables right now. So we're using it for multiplication. And all I've done is I've just taped over the grid that is there with numbers. So typically the vertical side has letters. I've just replaced it with numbers. And in order to play, my son has to say to me, okay, I'm gonna shoot for um, four times three. Four times three equals 12. And so we always give the vertical number first to avoid any confusion. So four times three, I understand what grid number that is. Uh, and if he gets it right and he happens to have hit my ship, wonderful. Um, if uh, he gets it wrong for the case of my son, I give him another opportunity. I don't say, oh, that was a miss. Um, you have to wait till next turn because that's something that would upset him. So know your child and work within their, um, what, what they will tolerate. If they're one that's gonna get upset that they got the math question wrong, therefore they missed, uh, then don't make them miss, keep it positive. Um, but if they're fine with that, then by all means say, oh, you got it wrong, so you missed. Uh, another great example of this is uh, to use the game Candyland. So this is one that I use with my youngest son because he's still learning how to play board games and he would get very bogged down in the rules of the game and Candyland is really rather simple. So our version of Candyland has a spinner, uh, but lots of them have cards as well. So uh, you can use whichever one you happen to have on hand. And for him, we're working on those uh, basic reading skills. So letter blends, what sound do different letters make? And so I just added some uh, letter blends onto the spinner and if he spins and hits red, he has to tell me that TR says tur, and then he can move to the next red space. And again, with him, um, if he gets it wrong, he just gets another chance and he can move as soon as he gets it right uh, because making him skip his turn because he got it wrong would be upsetting for him. Uh, so you can do this with anything. You can add in uh, math questions. You can add in um, just fact questions. You can use letter sounds, you can use sight words, but kids really engage well with this and it's a fun way to practice those skills. Oops, we went backwards. There we go. Uh, so this is the next one that I use frequently and that kids seem to really love. I use this in both tutoring sessions and with my own children and it's Lego. Um, so Lego is so fun on so many levels, not just building with it. Uh, we use it a lot for word building. So the example on the far left with the word disagreement, this is one that I've done with my oldest son. So we're learning about root words, prefixes, and suffixes. So we've taken the word agree and we've added the prefix dis to make disagree. And then we've added the suffix meant to get disagreement. And so we talk about what prefix, prefixes and suffixes are, how they change a word, and how we can use them to build larger words. Um, the middle one there, the word care, that's an example of what I do with younger students or my younger son. Um, and so we've taken the word car and we've added magic E as we call it. Uh, and we've seen how that E is going to change that word into care. Uh, and then finally, we do things like contraction building. So I will give them the, uh, the word on the bottom, so won't. And then they have a whole stack of words on different blocks and they have to build the contraction for me, build the root words uh, and tell me that will not is what makes won't. <clears throat> you can also use this for math. Uh, so we use it to build math equation towers. 
And so uh, you take something like a block that says six times seven equals, and then you have a block that says 42. And they'll build whole towers out of this. Uh, but the thing is, is that their equation has to work. So they have to actually give me the answer. Uh, you can use it to build things like algebraic equations too, if that's something that your child is interested in. You can see here that I am not an algebra person because I forgot the times symbol between the squared and the B, um, but that's okay because I'm, I'm not an algebra tutor. Uh, that's when my children are going to have a tutor themselves to help them with that. And then finally, I, I use it frequently for fractions because at Lego, they're, they're a ready-made fraction. So you can see here from the example that the block with eight dots on the top, that's our whole. So we're gonna compare every other block to that. So if it's got six dots, that's six over eight, which is three quarters. Uh, if it's got four, that's four over eight, which is a half. If it's got two, that's two over eight, which is a quarter. And then if it has one dot, that's an eighth. And I'll actually send out an example worksheet of using Lego for fractions uh, with the recording and your special offer so that you can see exactly how it is that I use that. And then finally, for putting a twist on activities, you can just create your own. Um, so I do want to preface this by saying that a lot of these ideas, they're not original to me. Um, I don't know that I've ever seen anybody using Battleship or Candyland the way that I do, um, but it's very possible it's out there. A lot of these ideas have actually come from other parents, teachers, tutors, uh, and I get a lot of these ideas from Pinterest. So search Pinterest, do a Google search, you'll find all kinds of these ideas. These are just a few examples of ones that I have found beneficial. Um, so check it out online and see what else you can find. Uh, so the first example that I have found to be really beneficial, especially in tutoring sessions, is Nerf guns and water guns. Um, so I create a Nerf gun or a water gun range. Um, and so the top picture here, that's just a whiteboard where I've written some sight words for my younger son. And he just takes a shot with a Nerf gun and if he hits it, he gets those points. And so there are a couple of ways to engage them with this. Um, you can have them tell you the word so they can say what and then they can shoot for what. Or you can ask them, okay, I want you to shoot what? And now, now they have to aim for that one. They have to identify it and, uh, and try to hit it. You'll also see that in this example, there are some homonyms here. And so I frequently will use this to practice those. So we have two, two, and two, there, there, and there. And I'll say to them, okay, we want the one that means the number two. So they have to identify that it's T-W-O that I'm talking about, or the contraction for they are. So they need to find there with the apostrophe in it. Uh, card games are also really great. Cards are just math manipulatives waiting to be used. Uh, so you can use these to learn all kinds of different math things. The example that I've given you here is to use cards to learn place values. So taking five cards and placing them into a place value chart to see how many different numbers that we can make or what's the largest number that we can make. It's a really great way to show children how by placing a number in a different sequence within the, the number, it's the larger number, uh, that we're actually changing its value. Uh, and so that one can be a lot of fun as well. And then finally, for learning opportunities, uh, life skills are a big one that we often forget about or that we don't consider to be an essential part of a kid's education, um, or we look at it as kind of a side thing. And so these are things that aren't typically taught in school, or if they are, they're taught on a minimal level. And right now we have the opportunity with kids being home to really drive home these life skills and help them to learn them and practice them. And this actually came out of a question from the last webinar where a parent asked, uh, my child has done all of their work by noon, should I make them do more work? Or what do I do with them now? Um, and both Dr. Sanders and I said, teach them life skills. So these are all things that we may not necessarily think about, but we've picked up throughout our lives and we can give our kids a head start by teaching them some of these now. So these are things like how to sew. So how to sew on a button, how to darn a hole in a sock, um, balancing a budget. So you can have your child work with you on your family budget, or if you're not comfortable with that, give them just a, a made up income amount and have them create a budget uh, based on that income, based on the things that they feel like they would want and need throughout the month. Uh, you can help have them help you with the grocery list. They may not be coming to the grocery store with you uh, right now, but they can help you with the list. Have them search flyers, look for the best deals, give them a budget and have them work within it. 
uh, those are all great skills that, uh, that every adult needs and that it's beneficial to learn as early as possible. There are other things that uh, kids may not use as often, but they're still helpful to have. Things like etiquette. Uh, we may not be throwing fancy dinner parties anytime soon, but you never know when you're going to have dinner with the queen or somebody important. And it's helpful to know uh, what fork you need to use or what glasses for what. All of those little things that we don't necessarily think to teach kids can be, this is a great time to start teaching those. Um, and things like a map reading and navigation, those are kind of a dying skill now that we have a GPS or sat nav and we can't always rely on those things. So learning how to read a map effectively to be able to uh, get yourself out of a situation if you happen to be lost or you need to get somewhere and your sat nav isn't working, um, those are all wonderful skills to have. So I highly recommend including these in your uh, learning opportunities with your child throughout your day uh, and work on some of these life skills as well. All right, and then finally, uh, I want to talk to those parents who are feeling like you're limited for time. So these may be the parents uh, who are working full time still, or uh, they just don't have the time to engage their children with all of this throughout the day, or maybe you're just struggling with being both parent and teacher. Um, so the first thing I wanna tell you is that you're not alone. I am in that boat as well. And um, so I'm giving you all of these great ideas that I do do with my children but it's hard right now. It's hard to fit that in. They're home all day, I'm working, uh, and it's, it can be a struggle to juggle everything right now. And so I just wanna remind you all, don't worry. Don't stress about this. We have enough stress on our plate right now. We don't need to add to it. Um, if you can inject a little bit of learning into your child's day each day, then you're way ahead of the game. You're doing a great job. So please don't worry and don't stress about this. Um, just interject the little fun things when you can, maybe ramp it up a little bit more on the weekend if you have time, but uh, your, your main focus should be just let's all get through this in one piece. Um, and we're all in this together, we're all struggling, we're all trying to figure it out together. So please don't be hard on yourself um, and don't worry. And so the big thing to remember when it comes to all of this is number one, do what works for your family. Um, there are a ton of things out there, lots of uh, suggested schedules throughout the day, lots of different activities that you can do with your kids, even the things that I've talked about on this webinar. The important thing to remember is that we can't all do it all and not everything's going to work for us. So find what works for you. Um, and to be completely honest, those parents who are posting all of their great daily schedules, all the things that their kids are gonna do today, there's a really good chance that after that picture was taken and posted, that schedule went out the window. Um, we need to be realistic about our expectations for ourselves and for our children right now, uh, because we're all struggling with this new normal and we're all trying to figure out what works. So just, if it works, do it. If it doesn't work, get rid of it. Uh, don't spend time stressing on it. So you'll see that all of the suggestions that I've got below all have or don't next to them because if it's not going to work for you, don't do it. Um, so if your family is the type that works really well with, uh, with scheduling and with a set routine throughout the day, then by all means create a schedule for yourselves and your children if that's what's going to work for you. Uh, a great thing to do with this is to involve your children in the scheduling process. So sit down each evening and create the next day's schedule together. This gives your children some ownership over the schedule. It helps them to, um, to engage with it better because they feel like they have helped create it. It's things that they know they need to do, that they want to do. Um, and so it tends to just work better if you involve them in it than if you say, this is what you are going to do. Uh, you tend to have more pushback if you don't include them. So if it works for you, set yourself a schedule and follow it. If you are the type of family like mine where you tend to fly by the seat of your pants and you just take things as they come, uh, then you, may, uh, your, you and your children may do better if you plan more self-directed activities and learning where uh, you can just give them something, allow them to explore it on their own, allow them to work through it on your own, their own and just bring any questions that they have to you that you can address here and there as opposed to guiding them through it because you do still have work commitments or other things that you need to be focused on as well. Um, creating checklists also is really helpful for this. So this picture here is actually an example 
from the checklist that my family has been using each day. And again, this is what works for us. It may not work for you. Uh, it's worth a shot. If it doesn't work, then throw it out. Let's find something different. Um, so what we do as a family is we sit down each evening and we decide what are the things that need to be done tomorrow. And my children don't do so well with the structure of a schedule. Um, my oldest tends to get really hung up on it and anxious about it. And my younger one just ignores it altogether. So we have found schedules don't work for us. So instead we've taken this checklist approach. And so each night the boys and uh, my husband and I sit down and say, okay, what needs to be done? And it gives them some ownership over it. Keeping in mind that they're six and eight, some of the things that they need to do each day are things like make sure that the pets are fed, make sure they have breakfast, get dressed is definitely on that list. Otherwise we would be having a no pants party. So we need to make sure get dressed is on there for them. But they're all things that they can work through throughout the day on their own. Um, and there's no set structure to it. So if they wanna get dressed before they have breakfast, that's fine. If they wanna do their worksheets before they feed the cat, that's fine. The cat may have other ideas and, and has to be fed right away, but so be it. We're kind of flying by the seat of our pants here. I have also set a stipulation on them that there are no electronics until 3 p.m. And so by that, I mean gaming devices because um, my children are very absorbed by screen time and nothing else would get done. And so they have to have their list checked off before they can have electronics. And uh, those electronics do not come out till three o'clock. So again, it's what works for us. And to combat the I'm bored, uh, so coming down uh, downstairs to bother me and say, Mom, I'm bored, I don't know what to do, we've created a, a are you bored list. So these are all things that the boys have suggested that they could do to combat that boredom. Uh, and so far it's been really effective for us. So if you want to adopt that, please by all means, um, and don't forget, do what works for you. Um, and if that means that your kids are not doing two hours of learning each day, that's fine. Uh, we're focused right now on getting through. So if that means that they just do a little bit, that's fine too. We just want a little bit of learning each day, even if that means they just read for half an hour. Um, and then so finally, if you are still feeling really stressed out about this and you are not sure how you're going to make this work, you're struggling as being both parent and teacher or your child is working on things and you just don't know how to help, it may be time to consider a tutor. Um, the big thing to remember is that tutors are not just the people who can teach your children something. They can also help your children structure their day. They can be that accountability coach. You can have a half an hour session with a tutor each day where the tutor checks in to see how your child is doing with the work that's being sent home from school. They can be the one to give those reminders and help to motivate your child. And they can answer those one-off questions that come up as well. So uh, tutoring is more than just those basic skill foundations uh, like reading and math. Uh, they can do a lot more. So if you're finding yourself stressed out, please uh, reach out, consider a tutor. Um, as I said, there'll be a special offer at the end of this for you. All right, so that's it for me. That's it for finding learning opportunities in your everyday. I see that there are some questions. So if you have any questions that you forgot to throw in, please pop them in now um, and we'll take a look at those quickly. Okay, uh, so can computer consoles and games be used to encourage learning? So absolutely. Um, so it really does depend on your child. So as I've said, my boys in particular are very absorbed by screen time. And uh, my youngest in particular can, can get rather distracted and it actually might not be a great learning tool for him. So the big thing with this is to know your child um, and to monitor it. And so just to make sure that learning is actually happening, we haven't uh, wandered off into the weeds somewhere and now we're watching YouTube videos of kids opening kinder eggs or whatever it might be. Um, so if that is something that works for your child, absolutely get them on onto games like Prodigy or, um, or those other learning games. There are things out there like your, your basic for entertainment games that you could potentially um, use as a learning game. I think maybe that's what you're actually uh, aiming towards. Um, Things like Minecraft and stuff, you could potentially uh, work that into a learning game, uh, depending on the needs of your child. But I'm not super familiar with all of the four entertainment games that are out there. Um, but if you see one that your child is interested in and you can see how you can put a learning twist on it, by all means, go for it. Um, so the next one is, can you make house chores into a game? Uh, is it good to use money as rewards? So yes, you can absolutely, sorry, absolutely make 
household chores into a game. Uh, there are all kinds of ideas that I've seen out there on Pinterest and or with a quick Google search. I've seen things like uh, teaching your toddler how to sweep by taping a, a square onto the floor and getting them to sweep everything into the square. Um, we frequently have uh, different races. Our, our kids seem to be really competitive. So it's uh, who can pick up all the laundry that's strewn all over your bedroom the fastest or uh, turning it into some sort of competition in some way, my kids really engage well with that. So whatever your kids engage with, uh, do it. Uh, if, if, they're, if they're willing to make chores into a competition, then, then go for it. Uh, using money as rewards, that really depends on your child. So you want to have positive reinforcements for the things that they're doing to encourage that behavior to continue. And you want to make it something that's meaningful to them. Uh, so if money isn't a motivator for them, find something else that is. Uh, maybe they're really motivated by uh, being able to go get an ice cream cone or, uh, or by screen time or whatever that might be. So find what works for them. If money is a motivator for your child, then use it as a, as a reward. Do what works. Um, I've heard museums that are offering walkthroughs online. Have you tried them? So I've taken a look at a couple. Um, I believe the one that I was looking at the other day was the Smithsonian, uh, but there are lots of different museums that are offering the walkthroughs. So by all means, check them out. Uh, one of the things that teachers will sometimes do if they're unable to get their class out for an actual physical field trip, they'll do a virtual field trip and they'll use things like those museum walkthroughs in order to get their, their students the experience without actually physically being there. It's not quite the same, uh, but especially in times like these, uh, it's an excellent alternative. And it's the opportunity to check out museums that you otherwise wouldn't be able to travel to. So uh, I don't know if the Louvre is doing a, uh, an, a virtual walkthrough, but if they are, you can see the Louvre without even going to France, which is, uh, which is awesome and uh, it's a really exciting thing to have uh, in this digital age to be able to do that kind of thing. Okay, uh, what is the role of TV in learning? Um, so that again depends on the child. Uh, if your child just kind of zones out and, and doesn't really take much in while they're watching TV, it might not play a great role, um, but it really depends on what it is that you're watching. So you can use things like documentaries to create teachable moments. Um, I did actually mean to touch on that and I seem to have skipped over it. Uh, so you can create teachable moments by just introducing your children to new things and uh, going with the line of questioning and curiosity that comes out of it. You could also engage them in conversations about things like books they're reading or songs that they're interested in or activities that they're trying out. Um, so when it comes to TV, throw on a documentary, sit down and watch it as a family and roll with those uh, those learning opportunities and teachable moments that come out of it. Um, there are a lot of TV programs that are directed to teaching children. Um, they tend to be a little bit lower level, um, but there are still great things like the NOVA programs. Um, I'll put a link to that in the resources that, uh, that I give out. I'm just gonna make a note of that, NOVA. Um, and so NOVA is a science-based uh, TV program that has a lot of really great content. I remember watching one from when I was about 15 on uh, quantum mechanics, and I still remember that. It stuck with me for some reason. Um, okay. Uh, thank you for helping parents keep it real. Absolutely. It's important to keep the stress low. Happy parents, happy children. I could not agree with you more. Um, we really need to remember that right now it's all about let's get through this. We need to be realistic in our expectations of our children and of ourselves. We can't do everything. Uh, so we need to take it one day at a time. We're all in this together and we'll get through it. Uh, but we don't need to do it with the added stress of trying to be both teacher and parent. So uh, take it one day at a time. And a big thing to remember is if there is work sent home from school and you're finding that it's too much, uh, your child's having trouble engaging with it, or they, they have a lot of questions about it, or it's just too much work expected of them each day, please reach out to your child's teacher um, and have a conversation about that. Teachers are new to this as well. Uh, this is a new experience for everyone, and they're trying to figure out what works too. So um, have a conversation with them. Let them know that this isn't working for us, and see if you can come to an agreement for something that will work better for you and your child. Uh, they're, they're there to help too, and they don't want you to stress either. Um, oh, and here's another suggestion for uh, a resource. The BBC 
So that's the British Broadcasting Corporation, for those who aren't familiar. Uh, they have a lot of learning material on their website uh, and things to help students catch up. So absolutely, uh, BBC has a really good kids side, uh, as well as some really great content for older children as well. So check that out. Even if you're not in the UK, it can be really beneficial as well. Um, Okay, so that looks like basically it for the questions. Um, so we've actually finished a little bit early today, which is, is great. As I said, I will send on those resources that I mentioned. Uh, we got through all of the questions today. So, uh, so if you have any additional ones, just let us know. Um, I believe that you can probably put them in afterwards. Um, if not, jump on the next webinar, ask them there, and I'll be happy to uh, at least include them as a resource. We will be having another webinar next Wednesday. Um, so this one, I believe we're going to be focusing on the SAT and the ACT for those students who uh, are unsure about what's gonna happen with those. Uh, we will have additional webinars as well, addressing the exams for other countries as well. Um, and then we're looking at future webinars within the series on things like uh, how the stress right now is impacting your ch child's learning ability uh, and how learning specifically works. Uh, and things like parent engagement on learning. So please stay tuned for future webinars. Um, and then as I said, I will be sending out the recording and some additional resources as well as a special offer for you. So um, yeah, so stay healthy, stay happy, try to stay stress-free, uh, take it one day at a time and remember that we're all in this together. If you can inject a little bit of learning into your child's day, then you're doing a great job. All right, be well everybody, bye.